Welcome today. We are glad to have you with us. Um, this is the webinar, Education and Uncertainty, Using Polarity Thinking to Face New Challenges, presented by Marin Burton of the Center for Creative Leadership, Donna Oram of the National Association of Independent Schools, and Doreen Kelly of Ravenscroft. My name is Tracy Dobbins, and I'll be your CCL webinar moderator today. With the spread of the normal coronavirus, we face new and unexpected questions in the field of education It's facing unprecedented stressors. We thank you for taking the time to join us today to explore how polarity thinking can help leaders navigate the most complex issues. During the webinar, please feel free to interact with us by utilizing um, questions in the, and comments in the chat. Direct to all participants. We will compile all of the questions Work with our presenters to answer each one and follow up with the Q&A document after the webinar. And today I'm pleased to have with us Marin Burton. Marin is with the uh, Center for Creative Leadership. She's a senior faculty member with the Societal Advancement Group, where she specializes in leadership program development, design and facilitation, and an intentional focus on engaged pedagogies. She leads the team's work in organizational leadership initiatives aimed at incorporating leadership development into the organizational culture. She's joined by Donna Oram. Donna is the president of the National Association of Independent Schools, which provides services to more than 1,800 schools and associations of, of schools in the United States and abroad, including 1,500 nonprofit, private K-12 schools in the U.S. Donna served as the Chief Operating Officer at NAIS for 11 years before becoming President. She joined NAIS in 1998 as the Vice President for Educational Leadership. And joining us is Doreen Kelly. Ms. Kelly is the leadership team, leads the leadership team of Ravenscroft and has been head of school since July 2003. She joins the Ravenscroft faculty in July 1999 as the Director of the Lower School. Ms. Kelly is a board-certified executive leadership coach. Welcome, Marin, Donna, and Doreen. And I'll now turn it over to Marin. Thank you, Tracy. In today's webinar, we are going to focus on learning all about clarity thinking and how it can specifically help educational leaders face our new reality, or as one of my colleagues calls it, our now reality. Explore, uh, we will also explore two of the most common polarity leaders uh, polarities leaders are facing in the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll also demonstrate how you can use this polarity method to create an action map to guide your next steps. Donna, I'm so glad we're having the chance to talk today about this important topic. Thanks, Marin. Um, first of all, let me join Marin in welcoming everybody that's on the call today. I know you have a busy schedule, so we're, we hope that uh, this time will be very helpful to you. Um, NEIS itself has profited greatly from the Center for Creative Ship work, and particularly some of their tools have been very helpful to us, and I think they're going to be helpful to you. Um, we've worked with CCL in helping us as an organization manage change and help to uh, enhance employee engagement. Um, we also most recently had them work with our board um, to really aim at doing a better job with making very complex decisions. And I think our, our board members found it incredibly helpful. And some of you on the call may have worked with CCL at our leadership through partnership program, um, which uh, they help us to create and enhance every year. And that program uh, really helps heads and boards work more effectively together. Um, Doreen has just been such a bright light in our world. Um, she has helped to develop and support new school heads for years as a member of our Institute uh, uh, for New Heads faculty. And what I really love about her is she's walked the talk of polarity thinking through her groundbreaking um, Lead From Here initiative in partnership with CCL. So uh, Doreen, would you like to say a few words about that? Sure, welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you join us in uh, this WebEx. Um, Ravenscroft School and, and Center for Creative Leadership have enjoyed, um, we're in the middle of a 10 year endowed partnership with a commitment to furthering research 
and development of citizen leadership pre-K through 12, not only for our students, but for all the adults in our community who are committed to supporting our students. So very proud and happy to be here with you all. Thanks, Doreen. Yeah, well, one thing that I certainly know in my position at NEIS is that the job of school head has become more complex for many years, uh, but today's circumstances are even more challenging. Uh, I know that uh, you on the phone today are called on to make decisions amid circumstances that frankly are changing hourly now. And some of the calls that we've gotten to you from you about uh, some of these decisions include things such as, should I be thinking about committing to virtual learning through the end of the school year? And how can I balance the needs of society today with the long-term impact on students, families, and the school itself? Really tough decision. Um, for many of you on the telephone, you have parents that are starting to say to you, um, are you going to refund part of my tuition, my fees? And, you know, what you're saying is, wow, this is such an unknown ahead of me. How can I even begin to make that decision um, before I understand really the long-term financial consequences of that? And I think really important, many of you have uh, probably been working seven days a week, uh, what it feels like close to 24 hours a day. Um, and you know you have to be there for your community, but you really have to take care of yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, many of you have said, I really feel like I'm burning out already and there's a long road ahead. And I, you know, all of these questions can be really tough to answer, and I hope that that's what we are going to dig in today. And, you know, why I think CCL is such a great partner in thinking about this is that uh, they conduct extensive and groundbreaking research on leadership, and they work with leaders around the world to help them achieve their greatest potential. And so I want to ask Maren from her perspective, because she's done so much work in this area, why do you think this current situation is so difficult for leaders in general? And why do you think decisions like the ones that we've talked about are, are so difficult? What makes them different than really the, the tough questions that leaders are called on to answer all the time? Sure. Um, you know, in general, I think the situation is so challenging because it truly is a crisis. Uh, most of us can name maybe one, maybe two times where we've actually lived through a crisis, and this is unparalleled. It's rare times, and what is most challenging is all of the uncertainty. It brings uncertainty forth for us, um, and then, of course, for all those that we lead. All of our worlds have just been rocked and we have to figure out how to operate in new ways. Uh, we have to do it on the fly, and we have to do this while doing the best we can to take care of those we work with. Thanks, Maren. Doreen, you're in this seat right now, and why do you think this is such a challenging time, other than the obvious for school leaders right now? Thanks, Donna. I think one of the biggest challenges right now for many of us is the pace of change that has happened and trying to pivot our own versions of Titanic, right? We're so used to place-based education um, and maybe some of us have had experiences with a blended learning environment, but many of us, if you don't have that experience, have to bypass that altogether into a virtual learning environment. And that's just simply tremendous. We're, we're worried about our students, we're worried about our employees, families um, and the impact of this disruption and, right, the big and is we've seen a tremendous effort to pull together um, within our communities, within the extended regional and national independent school community. And, and we also see the level of support being amazing. So there is a both and at play today. Thanks so much, Doreen. Maren, how do you think the tool that we're going to discuss today relates to this particular situation that leaders find themselves in? And do you think there are differences about how leaders need to approach um, how they lead from day to day in a crisis? Yeah, sure. 
So leaders are making some decisions that they've never faced before. Um, and in that process, it can be easy to think about very complex issues as either or, or to see things in black and white terms. Uh, we can get caught up in the idea that only one thing is right and that the other is wrong. For instance, some might be tempted to think either I keep my school open and take care of our kids, or if we close the school, it means we're abandoning them. And polarity thinking invites us uh, to see the tensions that exist within those decisions and move us from either or thinking into both and thinking. The challenges we're facing today are ripe with polarities or tensions that are interdependent. We must recognize this interdependence. And if we don't, it could, we, we could focus on one side of the tension while downplaying the other, and that would lead us to negative results. So instead of an either or choice, we can engage the question with both and thinking. So I can say, all right, while I must close my physical school, how can we take care of our kids while we make that decision? Both end thinking is always important to leverage as leaders, but in a crisis such as this, it is critical because the stakes are so high. Feedback loops are really fast and constant, and the, con the consequences for not leveraging both sides of attention can really be severe. Thank you for that. I agree that uh, both end thinking is critical today. Um, we certainly are using it ourselves at NEIS to guide our, guide, to guide our decision making through all these challenges. Could you spend some time briefly discussing the philosophy of polarity thinking and why you think this particular type of approaching um, leadership decisions can be so helpful to school leaders at this time? Sure. Polarity thinking provides a lens for seeing the world. Uh, polarities are two interdependent ideas, and they are interconnected. They have a predictable relationship. That idea is that there are two poles or ideas, and they have a tension between them. So let's take an example that many of us are probably dealing with right now. It's the idea of structure and flexibility. Educational leaders must provide structure and clear expectations as well as flexibility for how educators specifically teach during this time. Both focus areas or polls are good and important. As leaders, we get positive results from providing structure. We need to provide clear expectations about how we will educate during this time of robust change. Educators need to know what basic requirements um, there are for class time. They need to know what learning platform they should use and they will should be given basic expectations for what learning needs to look like virtually. This needs to be very clear for everyone. On the other side, there are positive results from providing educators with some flexibility. Educators must be given the chance to make virtual learning work for them given their specific subject matter. They need to be honored as professionals while they use their creativity and best practices in order to meet their specific learners' needs for their particular subject. If we focus on one of these things to the expense or the neglect of the other, we get predictable downsides. For instance, if I only focus on structure, I might micromanage to everyone's teaching. And if I told a music teacher or a physical education teacher to teach in exactly the same way that an English teacher might, I would limit that teacher's creativity and could curtail their best practices for their particular subjects. On the other hand, if I focus too much on flexibility to the neglect of structure, teachers might not have the clarity and direction they need from leadership in order to focus on their teaching. Teachers could become quickly overwhelmed if they had the big organizational ideas on their mind as well. So the goal is actually to get the upsides of both structure and flexibility. We need to give clear expectations about structure, what people can count on, and we have to allow for flexibility in order to maximize best teaching practices. Polarity thinking invites us into this both and thinking because we need both of these concepts, both poles in order to be effective. This is Dorian. I'd, I'd like to add, too, this has been so helpful to our leadership development as a team at Ravenscroft. 
um, because we're approaching all of our work from the both and perspective rather than chasing um, answers to problems that are actually dilemmas. And so it helps us consider being more open to additional concepts. And, and the overall feedback for our development as a team is that um, we're energized by interdependent thinking and the idea of that work being fulfilling. Really super hard in, uh, in a crisis, but um, we don't have control over this one. So being able to envision the challenge through the both end lens um, is certainly contributing to calm and sustained leadership right now. Thanks, Doreen. You know, I think as we think here in, about polarities, there are so many polarities that could be called out in this particular situation, but there are two that really stand out for me. And those are the polarities of short-term, long-term, and individual well-being and societal, societal well-being. So, Let's start out by talking about individual and societal well-being. I think most leaders on this call would agree that they want both, um, but in making decisions, it sometimes feels like these can be in conflict with one another, and you are forced into making what can feel like somewhat of a Sophie's choice. I think this is playing out every day in schools and um, making choices about whether to remain open or to move to virtual oper operations was one of those really very difficult ones because I think school leaders care so much about their communities but being part of the larger solution. Um, could you, Maren, talk a little bit about why you think polarity thinking could eliminate, eliminate a path forward here? Sure. You know, in times of crisis, what we're seeing from the health community is a call to action for every community member to take care of one another through social distancing. This example brings up a very important point about polarities in that sometimes we have to focus on or put more emphasis on one pole or the other given the current circumstances of our reality. But when we do that, when we have to put a focus, for instance, on societal well-being, we can't lose sight of the other side. So health officials are pleading with folks to emphasize the care of society. We need everyone to engage in social distancing in order to not overwhelm the medical system. We do this so that we can also protect the health and well-being of each of us as individuals. They're interdependent concepts. So rather than seeing these two things in conflict, we can do as leaders what's called narrating the polarity. So we have to name what people value about caring for the individual while we make choices to benefit society as a whole. So we could say something like, we recognize we are creating, making really difficult decisions that is having a tremendous impact on each and every one of you. And we know that your lives are being disrupted in immeasurable ways and at this time, in order to care for everyone's health, we need to engage in social distancing practices. We have to close our school. And this only works if we do this together. And we have to talk about how we'll take care of individuals while we make this choice and focus on societal well-being. Now, the key here is that if we were to make a choice to focus on individual freedom, for instance, and not attempt to regulate our interaction with one another, we would get predictable downsides of flooding the health system with more patients than it can manage. This is where we see the energy system, that predictable relationships of polarities. Because as we begin to get those downsides for society, we will also start to see the downsides for taking care of the individual. So more individuals will get sick, and when they need care, they won't have the resources they need, and we'll find ourselves in a vicious cycle. All of these, these two poles are interdependent. I would just add, Mara, and kind of a, uh, from a more specific um, point of view as head, that's exactly where we found ourselves as a school early on, really focusing on, oh, what events do we have to cancel? How do we take care of the individual needs of our campus? And it wasn't too long before we had to um, really engage in the broader moral imperative that you mentioned where, oh goodness, we were so focused in on our individual or community well-being, um, we had to engage in the polarity then of what was our societal well-being. 
And that once we kind of regulated and just sort of named what um, our higher aspirational goal was a community, we were able to balance that out, you know, take an immediate snow day for professional development. And that, that sort of balance snapped us into action and actionable items that helped us leverage both upsides um, that we felt good about that we were honoring the individual needs within our community and having um, an impact in a public purpose. Boy, that is just such an incredibly helpful lens, Jermaine. School leaders have really struggled with this decision to move to virtual schooling with particular concern, I think, around the equity issues. Um, your description of how the two polls interact demonstrates that this can be a both-end decision. I think when people see it as either or, it can tend to lead to paralysis or we also fall into unintended consequences, um, which can be uh, really tough for us to manage. Um, thank you for your thoughts about that uh, particular polarity. Now let's move to another one that I think is just as key, and that's the polarity of short-term and long-term impacts. Could you talk about this polarity and why managing to the upside of both of these polls is so important, particularly now that we are facing a crisis that could have so many immediate impacts, but also much longer-term impacts as well? Yes. Yeah, let's use the mapping tool that we hope all of you will be able to use after this webinar. So let's begin to map the tension. This is a process that you could do with your leadership teams, with your boards, um, with your faculty. Um, so if we look at this tension of short term and long term, there are upsides to focusing on the short term during this crisis. Of course, we have to. <laughs> there are certain values that will guide you and need to be honored as you make these decisions. So on this side, we can see that focusing on the short term allows us to meet current and emergent needs of our community. It allows us to be very responsive. As a result of this focus, we can build confidence as we respond to immediate needs. And this focus allows us to demonstrate how we are thinking about sustainability in the short term. We get the benefit of seeing immediate results and getting quick feedback that allows us to adjust accordingly. It's critical during this time. And then through, through this process, we're also demonstrating um, and really focusing on uh, the short-term financial performance. And now, on the other side, we have long-term concerns. And we want to make sure that we are viable as a school and school system past this immediate crisis. If we think about what we value in the long-term and really focus on that pull, we can discover unmet needs and we can address them. We can build confidence also from our strategic focus on the long-term needs, risks, and opportunities. And we, of course, can then focus on our long-term sustainability efforts. How will we thrive and survive after, after this uh, crisis is over? Um, and what's really kind of exciting in this time as well is that there's a potential to discover new innovations that allow us to be successful in the long-term, and there's an opportunity even to perhaps discover some transformational change, some things that perhaps we've needed all along. Now, those are the upsides, and hopefully everyone can see we need both of these things, that this isn't an either or choice. We need to focus on the short term while we also think through how will we be viable in the long term. Um, and it's, we have to leverage the upsides of both. Thanks, Maren. It's just incredibly helpful, I, you know, just seeing those broken out in that way. Um, it strikes me, too, that one of the underlying themes of polarity thinking is that as individuals, we often get locked into a position and can only see the upside of that position. This really tends to keep groups polarized and unable to move forward. Could you talk a little bit about how this polarity plays out in a community and how we can deal with it? Absolutely. Um, it's natural for us as humans to have a preference for one pole or the other. And that preference is something we need, really need to pay attention to because it can lead us to think that a focus on one side of the polarity is, quote, right. Um, and the challenge is that preference might lead us to an overfocus on one side to the neglect of the other. So let's play that through. If we focus on short term to the neglect of long term, we would stay in 
the status quo. We become quickly outdated. Uh, we've missed windows of opportunity that we discussed on the, on the other side. We might be tempted to only focus on incremental improvements. Um, and we could become too invested in kind of these silver bullet approaches. And we could suffer from rapidly shifting priorities according to all of the immediate pressures that are gonna be coming from many directions that you are all facing right now. And so that's what happens if we were to focus on just the short term at the expense of the long term. Let's look at the flip side. If we focus on long term viability to the neglect of being very responsive in the short term, we could become unresponsive to immediate pressures and needs. Our longer term investment could put the organization at final financial risk today. It could be harder to measure success and employees and those we serve could become concerned about our short term sustainability. As a leader, it can be really challenging to recognize that we have a preference and, and that that preference might lead us to an overfocus on one pole to the neglect of the other. And in times like these, we have intense pressures from the fears of others and their preferences. And that can lead to that overfocus. This is really, um, as Polarity Partnerships talks about it, it's a value fear proposition. The things that are the upsides are the things that we value and we want to fight to protect. The things that are on um, the downsides are the things we fear the most. And so as leaders, we have to leverage the upsides, the values of both. Maren, that's just, <clears throat> excuse me, such a beautiful way of um, managing that and an important tension um, that we are um, facing as leaders right now. We have to respond to the environment we're finding ourselves in, an, an international health crisis. We have to focus in on how we manage our everyday lives in the short term. And we have to make hard decisions now that allow ourselves to be sustainable and sustain our mission right now. So at the same time, we as leaders are, are thinking about how this will impact us in the long term. It's good to be mindful, I think, as leaders right now to, um, and, and how it shows up with us, right? And how we're leading right now. How are we treating people? Um, the decisions that we're making and how the external environment is putting this pressure on us. All of these things also will impact the long-term viability of our schools. And, and I just want to name as a leader, um, it can feel super overwhelming right now to think about the both, both of these things. And yet, that's what people are expecting us to do. And we have to make choices right now that are responsive to the current crisis. And we also have to be mindful of how those choices can have an impact um, on the long-term viability of our schools. So we have to make choices that give us the best chance to thrive after this crisis is over. You know, super challenging. And I think it's important as leaders to check in with ourselves um, as we're thinking about the impact on us as leaders and then by extension, our teams and our community. And I just want to name for me as a head of school right now, the polarity I'm working at every other day is sort of realism and optimism, right? And, and holding those two interdependent spaces, right? To, to be optimistic and, and balance the realism. And I wanna leverage the upside of both of them because um, the downside is not gonna be healthy for, our, for any school community. And so um, how we manage that as a team at Ravenscroft um, will we know contribute to our ability to support the larger community in the long term? That is just so important, Doreen, because I think, you know, I know myself as, uh, you know, at NAIS, as we have really wanted to support schools in the moment, it's, it's easy to wildly veer um, all to one pole. Um, and unless you have the kind of disciplined uh, type of framework that this is that this brings, because um, there are always in these tough decisions two competing values. And in this case, thinking about what's needed now over what's needed over time um, is crucially important. Um, and Maren, how do you think that 
polarity thinking really helps us to do that, to really get that kind of balance and to really work with these two competing values in, in ways that are, are, are going to get us where we need to go um, as a school community. To, to answer that question, let's take a look at another tension um, that I know many of you are facing um, and are probably <laughs> Uh, in the midst of, and, and that tension is about directive and participative or, or inclusive leadership. Uh, right now, parts of the school population are likely looking to the head of school for directive leadership. They need clarity around what the school will do, uh, what the data say, how information will be shared, even if a leader prefers a participative style or a more inclusive style. Now is probably not the time to be asking people whose nervous systems are activated in a fight or flight mode what they think the school should do. At this time, the future will be created, um, at the same time, I should say, the future will be created by the whole school community in a participative way. And we need to gain from the ideas, thoughts, and good contributions of those on our teams in order to make effective decisions. So during this time of crisis, school leaders will need to get both the benefit of being directive, making very clear decisions um, where people are clear on their roles, the goals, their responsibilities. We also have to get the benefits of participative or inclusive leadership. We need people's voices, their concerns, um, and we need their help in co-creating the future. Clarity mapping provides leaders with a way to plan to get the benefit of both, not just relying on their preference and not just responding to the pressure exerted uh, by those closest to them. I would agree with that, Maren. We're, we're working through that in real time right now as a team, and it's tempting to lean into your preferences in ways that are potentially not particularly healthy, right? If you're in a complete directive mode, no one is staying with you, um, we've done such training in this work in polarities, um, even though it was tempting for me as a head of school to lead in, you know, our associate head of school, Colleen Ramsden, is a rock star. And it was like, no, you've empowered me to do this work. Let me go do this work. And um, in, in all truth and love and feedback was um, capable of saying, get out of my way, right? Um, you're, you're leaning into this directive space and to leverage the upside on behalf of the institution. We have to stay in this both and mentality. Um, and we've got this. And so um, to Donna's point earlier, um, you, you want to avoid sort of that paralyzing decision-making process. Um, it's fluid. Obviously, we all have individual teams that we can lean into of where you can leverage the upside in an ever-changing crisis. But that's just one example where I'm starting to stretch into kind of a little bit of a preference um, that was not um, going to be in the best of the institution. And it was really important to allow really talented colleagues to be empowered. And we're in a better space today um, for managing the both and um, rather than staying in the either or mentality. That is so incredibly helpful. And I think, you know, uh, all the leaders on the phone can really identify with that. And, um, you know, and I think polarity thinking is so helpful. Um, you know, and in thinking about how we stay on the upside of both of these polls, one thing that strikes me is it gives uh, school leaders today an opportunity to really model the principles of distributed leadership but also to leverage the community of school leaders that we have uh, within the independent school world. We can really learn from each other. But one thing that I'm seeing on the ground now is school heads who are really trying to do it all. I hear stories of people who are barely sleeping. Um, they're, you know, managing like inboxes full of a thousand emails and trying to get through them. and. Um, and frankly, it's really causing burnout. But I think, you know, one thing that we also haven't talked about today, we've talked about our community, is the role of school boards. And I believe that school boards in particular can play an important role in advancing this discussion around long-term implications 
and various approaches we might take to mitigating them. Um, a lot of this for the boards, I think, is around thinking about scenario planning and what are the various risks for the schools and what are our approaches um, depending upon how that plays out. You know, I, and I also think as a community of school leaders, we can work together to address the most impactful challenges. I think, you know, we don't have to solve all the problems by ourselves, but we really have to lean on each other. And by doing so, we can really um, work together to address the most impactful challenges for the industry, but also leverage the most um, promising opportunities, because I think there are a lot of those out there right now, and I'm, I'm actually seeing from some of the comments that people are talking about that as well, the, the opportunities for innovation now. Absolutely. And, you know, I just want to point out from your comments that care of the community and care for self is another really important tension um, that we need to have the upsides of both. Um, and, and just to put just one more finer point on this, you know, this, this tendency perhaps to see these tensions as right or wrong um, can lead us again into these either or um, thinking patterns. And we can say, no, we have to focus on structure. It's a square, right? Or we can say, no, flexibility is where we really need to thrive right now. It's a circle. And really where the truth is or where what's most helpful for us is that cylinder where we're leveraging the upsides of both. That's so true. Um, could we go back to the mapping tool for a moment? Because Absolutely. I think um, I, what I really love about this tool is um, once you've mapped the upsides and downsides of the polarity, um, we can really use it to move to implementation. Um, and, and that's why this is just such a great framework, I think, to structure your next steps. Um, Doreen, you have done an enormous around, uh, amount of work with polarities on your team. Could you talk about how, once you've gone through the upsides and the downsides, how a school would identify the most important action steps and call out those early warning signs so that they could have um, uh, really a guide for the future? And, um, and show us, you know, if we could go back to the mapping tool we used earlier, how you would do so. So thank you, Donna. I would offer um, for the immediate, because I know folks listening in are, are, are really anxious to kind of think about the immediate. As we consider this tool, I would offer three steps. One, it's been very important for our team to identify the why. Um, and you'll notice on this map up top, it talks about the greater purpose. And having alignment as a team, what is our greater purpose? Okay. Um, and then also being able to name what's the deeper fear. I think oftentimes we um, get all set on what the greater purpose is. And when you don't name the deeper fear, um, you can't get to identifying the early warning signs because you just haven't named them. Right. And so if you can't name them, then when they happen, you can't even see them. You can't be able to articulate. So that would be step one. Number two is um, make sure your team feels safe enough to give the feedback. Colleen gave me the feedback, that truth and love in the moment. And it was critical because um, I had belief that I was storming ahead on behalf of the short term in a very directive way. Um, and it was not going to lead to a good action step to leverage either for the short term or the long term. Um, so number two was really, you know, seeing feedback as a gift and creating safety for those around you to give you that immediate feedback um, and not expect an overcorrection or overreaction by you to be able to receive it, synthesize it, and be able to place it in the context of the map. And then the third thing I would offer is see in the middle of the chart where you see short term and long term, as a team, we've committed to the use of and, and every time we're tempted to use the word but, we pause and say, what does it sound like when we replace it with and? Well, I, I like to do that, but I don't think that would be a good idea. Shuts down the conversation immediately. We're not able to move forward. But the third, uh, that would be my third offering. If we substitute the word and, 
you keep uh, centered at the middle of the chart. The ideas are no longer competing. There's an opportunity to see the interdependence um, with the short term and the long term or whatever polarity you set up. You set the possibility for interdependence to exist. Um, and you keep that space rather, most of us are in the space, we've gotten to these jobs because we're good at solving problems. We cannot solve the problem of an international health crisis. So the more we keep trying to chip away at that, it gets deeply frustrating and even more exhausting than it is. There's hope through the lens of polarity thinking. That's great. And I would just jump in and add, um, you know, great job describing um, this process. And Doreen, as you know, um, you know, the, the real beauty can come in then with creating these action steps and those right. early warning signs. So I have these up on the screen. Um, you know, you can see in order to get the upsides of short term decision making and planning and responsiveness, what are the things that you need to do in order to get those upsides? And those action steps are on that side. So you might do various things. We've put up a couple kind of generic examples. Um, but you can see a couple of really important action steps in order to get those short term upsides. On the flip side, there are action steps we need to take in order to get the upsides of long term viability and sustainability. And so being able to identify uh, with your team um, or for yourself as a leader, what are those action steps that we need to take in order to get the upsides of long-term thinking and planning. On the flip side, so the bottom side of this map, um, are the early warning signs. And for each of these tensions or each of these pulls, you want to brainstorm what are the things we start to see? What are the early warnings or indicators that would indicate to us that we are focusing on one poll to the expense or at the expense of the other. So, for instance, on the right side, if I were to overplay the long term at the expense of the short term, I can, I can see what downsides I would get and I'd want to identify what are those early warning signs or indicators that would start to tell me we're starting to overemphasize that long term focus. On the flip side, on the left screen, I want to think about if I were to over focus on the short term at the expense of long term, I can see what downsides I would get and then what would be those early indicators that I was overplaying the short term. Thank you so much for that, Mar. And I know, um, just to riff a little bit on what you said, and I know um, lots of people are thinking about how do we play this out in decisions that we have today. And I think, you know, just the short term, long term um, for NEIS, um, we have uh, used it really at the top level for thinking about the whole organization, but we also have cascaded it down throughout the organization for each of our teams. So if we say, you know, here are the action steps that the leadership team should take, you know, what are the steps, for example, that our team on governance and leadership, you know, how do we keep moving forward and, you know, what do we pause for to really make sure we're doing in the short term. What has been so interesting, I think, in that process is that um, you find a lot of things that you can leverage in the short term to also help you with the work that you're doing in the long term. So, um, and it also helps uh, to see where there are gaps, I think, as well in your thinking. I'm, that's for me, one of the, the, the most valuable things um, about polarity thinking is it brings a kind of a holistic view to the work that you're doing. So, um, I, you know, I thank both of you for your explanation of polarity thinking. And I know we've um, gone through mapping and, um, and generally what, how the philosophy works, but um, Maren, are there other resources that uh, uh, those of us who are on the call today could use to learn more about polarity thinking or, or even to get um, some sample maps um, about common polarities and how they may play out? 
Absolutely. And I want to just recognize, obviously, a quick less than one hour webinar is probably not going to be sufficient for us to fully understand all of the complexities of polarity thinking. And I do believe even this basic understanding of the, the mapping process um, is, is, can be really helpful. Um, so I'm going to show a couple resources and then Doreen, were you interested in walking through um, a specific example? Did I see that? Well, I'm, I'm happy to reach out to others or offer a quick one right now. Many of us right now under the short term, long term um, polarity thinking around finances, intuition, refunds. Um, you know, I can give a specific example. We have a lot of other bond financing that's triggered. Um, so making a short term decision, for example, um, to refund tuition would have a deep long term impact on our, our bond financing and that process. So literally mapping that out to think about before we make a knee jerk reaction to it, to put it in that context and see what are we able to do. Um, we are delivering on virtual learning. We are holding firm on expecting um, tuition payment, and we've gotten positive results within our community. However, in mapping it out, we are refunding our bus, our extended day, and things that are not within our, our tuition bound um, letter of agreement and contract. So rather than run to a short term solution because we've received some pressure and some questioning about that, it's just pausing it. Um, again, we're not always physically mapping this out. What we're offering is a way to think about it, to just pause and, and, and consider um, that long-term implication while we're feeling the pressure in the short term. So um, I know uh, a couple of you had asked about that. It's a specific example that I know today and tomorrow I'm working with our finance committee of our board to literally think about it through this lens. Oh, that's perfect. Really helpful. Thank you for those examples. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about polarity thinking um, and you start to geek out on it like I do, there is, um, you know, definitely some resources for you to, to dive into. So this work is, is based on the work of Barry Johnson and the Polarity Partnerships Organization. We have an incredible um, connection and partnership with them. Um, you can see on the left, uh, Barry Johnson's book, Polarity Management, um, and uh, just a, an incredible read, as well as um, Unleashing the Positive Power of Differences, specifically about polarity thinking in our schools. Um, visiting the Polarity Partnerships website is also a great resource. You should be able to find some blank maps and um, some other resources that would be incredibly helpful. And then, of course, um, if we can be helpful to you in your journey um, at the Center for Creative Leadership, we would love to partner with you. Um, we do all sorts of <laughs> virtual trainings, live online work, um, and this can be done um, from all of our homes as well. So um, if, if we can be helpful to you um, in a way, please absolutely uh, reach out. Thanks, Marin. I know when you first told me about polarity thinking at uh, Leadership Through Partnership and you mentioned Barry Johnson's book, um, I, uh, I bought it uh, before I headed home on the plane and uh, actually devoured it. And it is, I think if, if for those of you on the phone, if you haven't read it yet, um, I think you will really enjoy it because you'll have a lot of aha moments where you'll say, oh, no wonder I couldn't solve that problem because it was an unsolvable problem. It was really a polarity. Um, but while we still have a few uh, moments left, I want to take a little bit of a pivot because, uh, and we've talked about this a little bit with uh, our leaders burning out. Um, I think it's really important that we pause and talk about um, how leaders take care of themselves to ensure that they can lead through the difficult times. Because I think, you know, just watching the reports, uh, we know that we probably are, have a long way to go and uh, we really need to make sure that uh, we have the stamina for the challenge. So could you talk a little bit about that, Marin? Yeah, um, like many of you, um, I often wake up at, you know, three in the morning with the current crisis on my mind and 
uh, really have to think about how I'm taking care of myself in the midst of this. And as educators, I think um, it can be really challenging for us to think about how we need to take care of ourselves. We're in the service providing industry and um, sometimes it can be a, a harder shift to think about, I also have to be able to take care of myself in this process. And so uh, the center has uh, recently, um, I benefited from an article that we recently released about how to build resilience during this time. And so I'll just emphasize um, three of those of those uh, practices. Um, so the first one is um, to manage your personal energy by showing, showing up as best as you can in the moment um, by giving your best. And that really includes staying uh, as present as possible. So our research on resilience definitely consistently shows that the more you can be present and take this crisis day by day, and for some of us that means minute by minute and hour by hour, um, that we're able to build our resiliency. If we start to catastrophize or catastrophize in the long term um, and really start to think about all the ways in which um, our whole world has changed and we let that over overplay, um, we won't be able to be there for our people and for ourselves. Um, we also suggest that you shift your lens or take charge about how you're thinking about adversity. I've been seeing some comments about, you know, not wasting a good crisis. This is exactly what we're talking about, about shifting your lens and really defining um, how you're going to think about adversity. Um, and really to work to understand your own beliefs about the situation and to actively choose your response. And so, in this process, it's just so critical to exercise compassion for yourself as well as for others. Know that you are in a grieving process likely, um, so are the people around you, and that that means we're going to have emotional swings and ebbs and flows of our energy, um, our ability to be productive, and so will everyone else. And so, you know, there's a reason you're told that you need to put your own mask on <laughs> before you help someone else. Um, with that oxygen mask because you're no good to others if you're passed out. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we really want you to think about how you are being compassionate for yourself at the same time that you are um, taking care of others. And then finally, you know, getting in touch with your sense of purpose at this time is just critical. Um, what gives your life meaning? And I know all of you are in education because you care deeply about educating our next generation. And that drive and that purpose needs to fuel us during that, that time. There is opportunity here, even if it's not what we would, ever would have chosen. Thanks, Marn, for those really helpful words. And, you know, I hope this overview of polarity thinking has helped you. Uh, it's one of those things that I think the more you dig into it and start working with it with your leadership team or your board, um, you will find polarity after polarity. And, uh, you know, I know some of my colleagues at NAIS, when we first uh, learned about it, people were finding, um, and this may be a fun exercise that we're now at home, all the polarities between spouses and partners. <laughs> so, um, it can be very enlightening in improving those personal relationships as well. So, um, but we are also aware that you had many, many questions during this um, uh, webinar. And Marin and I and Doreen are going to put our heads together afterwards to, to see how we can give you some follow-up resources, answer specific questions, and see how we might uh, develop more resources because I know how complex uh, the, the questions are you're facing today and we really want to help you use this tool. I firmly believe it's one of the best frameworks out there for decision making. And also I think I have found in my own experience that um, it's great to get people out of certain behaviors that feel like uh, they will never change or they keep you from getting past a particular situation. So. So I want to thank Marin and Doreen um, for taking the time with me today to explore this framework, which is just so incredibly powerful um, at a time when I think we need it most. My pleasure, yes. Doc. Glad to be here. Um, and thank you both 
so much for the leadership you're providing our communities during this time, as always. I'm so grateful for the partnership we have with both of you and your organizations, and I continue to be inspired by the leader, inspired by the leadership example you set every day. Thank you so much for your work. Tracy, I'll turn it to you. Thank you so much, ladies. That was a wonderful session. Appreciate um, the the opportunity to to have a, a wonderful session like this, and for taking time to explore how polarity thinking can help leaders navigate the most complex issues. We want to remind our audience to download the articles and white papers available in the course resources, and um, also we'll be sending those out to you in a follow up email with a link to the webinar recording and those resources and the Q&A document that the ladies will be working on. Again, as you exit the webinar, we hope you'll take a moment to complete the evaluation so we can continue to make these online events well worth your time. Appreciate you joining us today and be safe. Thank you, everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts. Is our audio off? Thank <laughs> you.